In this video, I'm going to talk to you about the Objective-C programming language. And as part of this, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of object-oriented programming. We're just going to cover enough of this so you can understand how to use Objective-C to create iPhone applications. Now, the lab for this week is pure programming. There is no user interface at all for this. And it's important that you spend the time and get familiar with the syntax and understand how to use the language to create efficient code. Now, our starting point is we're going to talk about object-oriented programming. Now, the principle behind object-oriented programming, we're going to turn our program into a series of entities. And each entity corresponds to something in our system. And we call these entities objects. So, for example, a university system might have a student entity. It might have a staff entity. In fact, it might have several entities for each. It might have room entities, it might have floor entities, faculty entities, and so on. Now, what's really interesting about this is if we looked at all the student entities, you'd notice that even though each student has different values fields, the headings you use to describe a student always remain the same. So in other words, there's some form of template we could use to turn out lots of student objects, which defines the what we call instance variables that student needs to have and how we interact with it. Now this template we call a class. So we use a class to create one or more objects. So in this example we're going to have a student class and we could use that student class to create lots of different student objects, as many as we wanted. So one important feature of object-oriented programming is something called encapsulation. And encapsulation means all the data that is required by the student object is stored inside the student object. So it doesn't need to have any external data at all. And the data is protected from outside. You cannot access data directly in an object. You have an interface, if you like, to access the data. And we access the data from outside using this interface. So if you want to change the instance variables, the data that we're holding, we can have properties which come in two flavors. We can have getter properties, which allow us to get a value from the object. And we can have setter properties, which allows us to set or change the value of an instance variable. Sometimes, though, we want to carry out actions. And in object-oriented terminology, an action is called a method. So, for example, we might have an instance variable for a student called name. We might have a getter to retrieve the name. We might have a setter to change the name. We might have a method called enroll on course. Okay, because the methods reflect verbs. Getters and setters properties refer to nouns. We have these so we can control how the data is changed. So we can have validation in place so the data doesn't get changed into the wrong thing. We could change the way the data is stored without changing the public interface. And in Objective-C, the public interface, the bit that's seen by the outside world, is stored in a header file, and the code itself is stored in the implementation file. So in this example, we're going to create a student class. And we need to be able to create new student objects by using a special method called an initializer. We're going to have a class constructor eventually to create students from a student class and we're going to have getters and setters for the student name and the student program. The student ID however is going to be read only, we're only going to create a getter for that. So let's have a look at how we create a new class in Objective-C. So in Xcode you right click on the project folder, you choose new file and there's a section called Coco Touch. And within there, there's an option called Objective-C class. So we click on that, and we give it a name. Traditionally, all classes start with capital letters, and all objects start with lowercase letters. So we can see quickly if we're dealing with an object or if we're dealing with a class in our code. And when you've created your new class, you'll have two files. You'll have a student.h file, and you'll have a student.m file. The public interface is in the student.h file. And in this one, it's very simple. 
we import the foundation framework, which is all our key classes we need to use. Then we define an interface. Now, the name of the class is mentioned, but after the colon, that's the name of the superclass, the class it's based on. And if you don't declare a class it's based on, it's based on a class called NS object, which is the great ancestor of all Objective-C classes. And there's an end, which is the end of the interface. In the implementation file, you'll see we've got an implementation directive and we've closed that at the end with an end. But we import our own header file into the implementation file. So let's have a look at how we create our properties. Now, in most languages, you create the instance variables first and then create the getters and setters afterwards. In Objective-C, it's the other way around. So first of all, we declare our getters and setters. We declare our properties. So as you can see, non-atomic basically means you can only have one of them, which is fair enough. But in the third example, because we only want a getter, we declare it as read-only. And the copy ensures that every object has its own copy of this property. You're not sharing the same property. The first two are NS string objects, and the last one is an NS number. And if you look carefully at the syntax, you'll see a couple of interesting things. The first is the asterisk in front of the instance, in front of the name of the property. The asterisk means it's a pointer, and if you're doing C++ programming, you'll be familiar with that concept. The other feature is, at the end of each line of code, there is a semicolon. It's very important you don't miss that off. And if you do, it'll tell you, it'll warn you. We've created our properties. So the next job is in the implementation file, we need to create our instance variables, the actual objects, the data where we're going to store the values. And to do that, we use a special directive called at sign synthesize. And this is unique to Objective C. And what we do here is we say at sign synthesize name equals underscore name. And that means the name property stores its values in an instance variable called underscore name. And we use the underscore so very easily in our code we can identify if we're referring to instance variables or if we're referring to properties. And you can see I've synthesized all three of my properties and I've now got three getters and two setters. No other code required. Sometimes though you want a property which is private which can't be seen by the outside world. And in that case, what you do is you declare your property in your implementation file in what's called a class extension. And that class extension goes before the implementation directive. So we've got another read-only property, another getter called grade. And you can see in the implementation file, I've synthesized grade to a local instance variable called underscore grade, just as before. So now we've created our properties with getters and setters and we've created the instance variables that we're going to use to store the values it's time to create our first object and you'll see that creating an object is a two-step process now if you look carefully at the first line of code here you'll see that we created a new student object called stu1 because it's an object we create a pointer and so we use the asterisk Creating an object requires a two-step process. The first step is called alloc, and we're calling the method called alloc. And you can see from this code how we call methods. We use square brackets, we put the name of the class or object that we want to use, in this case it's a student class, a space, and then the name of the method we want to call. So we're calling the alloc method on the student class. Now, you'll also see that it's nested inside another pair of square brackets with an init method. And the init method is the default initializer. Now, initializers in other languages are called constructors. So what we're doing, we're allocating enough memory for the object to exist on the heap. And then we're initializing it, we're running the, the initializer to create the object. And we're turning the pointer, which we're storing in stu1. So that's the process of creating a new object. Now, because we've got a setter called name, I can say stu1.name equals, and I can assign a value to it. As simple as that. Now, on the right-hand side of the equal sign, you'll notice that when I put a string literal inside quotes, I also put an at sign in front of it. And that's because there are two types of strings you can use in Objective-C. 
you can use NS strings and you can use C strings, which are arrays of characters. In this case, I want a string object, an NS string. And the at sign is shorthand for this is an object. So I'm assigning the mark string literal to the name property of STU1. I then do the same for the program. And then I'm going to print it to the log to make sure it contains what it should contain. But look what happens when you try and print your object to the log file. You get this sort of random hexadecimal value. Because what we're actually printing here is the address of where the object is stored. Because remember, the SG1 contains a pointer. It doesn't contain the actual object. So our next step is to try and fix that. What we're going to do, we're going to override a method called description. And the description method returns an NS string. And the idea is that when you try and print an object, it looks for the description method and runs the code in the description method automatically. And as you can see, the description method returns an NS string, which is what gets which is what will get printed in the log. So in the example here, I'm simply returning the name property. So it should print the person's name when I try and print to the log. Now, even though I'm accessing it from outside, and it's a public method, I haven't got to put the declaration in the header file because we're overriding an existing public method. So now, if I run the same code again, it'll print out my name rather than the memory address of where the object's stored. And the bottom line of code shows how I can explicitly call the method in my object, just so you're familiar with the way of calling methods. So square bracket, name of the object, space, name of the method, close square brackets. But in this case, it's automatically handled by the NS object class. So let's have a go now at creating a method for our class, a public method. Now, the fact I've called it a public method should give you a clue that we have to put something in the header file in the public interface. And what I've done here is I've defined a method called set name and program. And there are two parameters, two NS string parameters. Now look carefully at the declaration of my method. In any other language, you would have the name of the method, an open bracket, and then the parameters separated by, by commas. In Objective C, you'll see that the parameters are embedded inside the method name. So set name, and then I pass it an NS string with a name, and program, and I pass it a second NS string. It's one of the hardest things to get used to when you're starting out with Objective C. And what I do now is I take that line of code, I paste it into my implementation file, and I add the implementation code. So self.name equals name, so I'm assigning the name parameter from my method, from my method to the name property, and I'm assigning the program parameter to the program property. You see self.program, the word self means this class. In Java, you'd say this dot something, in Objective-C, it's self dot, whatever it happens to be. That's how you access your properties inside the class. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about initializers. An initializer is a special method that we use to create new objects. Now, Creating objects is called instantiation. And if you were using any other language, you'd call these method constructors. But we call them initializers. And when we created the student object, we used the default initializer defined by NSObject, the superclass. There are actually three ways to create objects in Objective-C. The first one is to call the initializer, whether it's the default initializer, like in the example here, or whether it's a custom initializer that we've written, you can simply alloc init and call the initializer. In the second way is you can use an existing object to create a new object. So in this example, the string object has a method called string by appending string. So we call the method on an existing object and that returns a new string object. And the third way, which you'll come across quite a lot, is a lot of classes have class methods. And the class method you call from the class, not from the object. So in this example, ns number number with int, we're calling number with int directly from the class. We're not creating the number object first. So let's have a look at how we'd create a custom initializer. Well, we'd start off by using this boilerplate code. The first thing we do is we declare 
the initializer. And the initializers must return an ID. Now it's not ID star because ID is a pointer. Okay, so we just put ID in. And in it, you can call a method whatever you want. I've just called mine init. And the first thing we do in here is we call the constructor of the superclass. So self equals super init is calling the init method on the superclass, which is NS object. And then it's always good to test to make sure we've got an object. Because if that first line of code fails, then there's no point doing anything else. It's a waste of time. So if that creates an object, if self, we can add whatever code we want to add. And then finally, we return self, which returns a pointer to the object. And that's how we create a new initializer. So I'm going to create another initializer called init with ID name program. So I put that line in my header file. I declare that initializer. And then in my implementation file, I add the code. So self equals super init, if self, and then I copy the values from the parameters into my new object. Now, if you look carefully, I'm not using the getters and setters. I'm not using the, I'm not using the properties, I'm using the instance variables. This is the only time you should be using instance variables directly, because until you've run this code, there, there is no student object. And if there's no student object yet, there's no getters and setters. So we have to assign values directly to the instance variables. The final thing we're going to talk about is how we create class methods. If you look at the first example, you'll see an example of an instance method. We call in description on the STU object. You can see that in those square brackets. In the second example, we're calling string with format on the NS string class, not on the object. So let's create a class method. And the first thing you notice is there's a plus sign in front of the signature. If, a, if you have a, the minus sign means it's an instance method, the plus sign means it's a class method. And you can see this class method returns a student pointer. So we're going to say student with name, pass it a name string and program with a program string. And here's how we can implement this. Now, the important thing about class methods is because you're not calling it on an instance, there are no instance variables. So you can't refer to any of the instance variables that are part of the object until you've created the object yourself. So in this example, I'm creating a new student object. I'm assigning values to the name property and this program property, and then I'm returning the student object. And we can test this very quickly. Student Asterisk two equals student, student with name, program. And that, well, that is the student class method, which returns a student object. And you'll see that used a lot with the built-in foundation framework classes. So hopefully we've covered enough today so you can get started on programming in Objective-C. You should now be able to attempt the lab for this week.